Okay, since it's 7 o'clock already, we will begin the meeting today. Um, if everyone here would please mute your mic um, and I'll begin. So good evening slash afternoon to everyone. I am Casey Vong, the ALS National Honorary President and also the President of the Greater Princeton Branch. I was awarded the ALIS scholarship back in January alongside Andy Ku, and today I will host this meeting as an introduction to the ALIS Scholar Network. To begin, I will introduce the principal missions of the ALIS Scholar Network and explain why it was founded. This network was founded to recognize. Could everyone just mute your mic, please? Wait, do you mind muting your mic? He has the highest role, I think. He would. Yeah, that's what they told us. So. Wait, Jordan, can you mute your mic? Sorry. That's how far he took A list, too. Now, A list is like the go to for Asian. Wait, people. wait, Jordan. All right. <laughs> it's her. So um, to begin, this network was founded to recognize outsta outstanding high school graduates who have made notable contributions to the community. It also intends to provide support to many high school graduates from ALIS every year by creating a supportive community that will keep them going throughout college, their careers, and life. So every year, the AYLF Board of Directors will issue an ALIS scholar scholarships and certificate of honors to these high school graduates among the ALIS members who have made an outstanding contribution. The ALIS Scholar Network is a platform that encourages college students to carry out community service activities on campus and in their surrounding communities. These ALIS scholars will lead this platform alongside the advisor group and we welcome high school graduates and college students to join. The advisor group is composed of the AYLF directors and the ELIS branch advisors. We also welcome anyone with a passion for community service to join. The advisor group will provide consultation and guidance for the ELIS Scholar Network. Finally, the ELIS Scholar Network encourages its members to initiate academic and community service projects with the, initiator, with the initiator of the project being the leader of it. So today's development summit will be focused on sharing experience pertaining to fundraising, recruiting new members, and leaving a lasting impact in our communities. To begin, we have invited Christina Liu, the recipient of the Brave for Righteous Righteousness Scholarship and the president of the ALOS Philadelphia branch. Thank you, Christina, for joining us today. Um, would you like to share a few words to our audience? Thank you so much, uh, Cassie. Um, good, af uh, good afternoon slash good evening, everyone. Um, thank you. Um, this, sorry. Thank you so much for joining and I, Hopefully, um, because I'm just starting out for my own organization of a branch of ALIS, I hopefully I can learn things about from you guys, and I hopefully I can contribute to the conversation as well um, for my point of view. Thank you, Christina. Um, next, we have. Um, the recipient of the ALA Scholar Scholarship, Andy Gu, the president of Pureland Branch, to share his experience in fundraising and volunteering. Thank you, Cassie. Should I share my screen for the PowerPoint or? Yeah, you can do that. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay, cool. So thank you all for joining us today, or give me one second, please. Sorry. So thank you all for joining us today. My name is Andy Gu. As Cassie said, I'm the Palin Branch President. I'm also the A-List Scholar recipient for this year. 
and I'm also the National Fundraising Committee Chair. Um, so today I just want to talk to you guys a little bit about fundraising, um, our fundraising efforts over the years and our history um, as a branch in our journey. So first a little bit about me, I'm a current um, high school senior. I joined A-List back in um, 2017. And at the start of our branch, we only had three members, we had three founders. When I joined, we had grown to about 60 members and currently we have over 160 members. Um, the first year that we started, or I guess the first four year that we started, we had 28 events. And this past year, we had just hosted over 75 events, even despite COVID and more. Um, so in our beginning years, we sought to collaborate with a lot of the, our local organizations. Uh, for example, Dawson Asian Culture Club, Palin Parks and Recreation, the Nursing Homes, Palin Chinese Association, and much, much more. Um, we formed a list of staple events that we've continued across the years. Um, some dropped because of certain challenges. For example, COVID has made it difficult to perform in nursing homes. But many that we've still kept, for example, the July 4th celebration, which you see in the picture above, um, a school supply packing event for one of the local Houston area schools, um, which you see in the bottom picture, those are events that we've continued across the years. So we have a lot of variety of events. Um, even though many things have changed, uh, we've tried to maintain a lot of our events and we've expanded and added new ones. Um, one of the greatest strengths of our branch, I believe, is the diversity of our events, right? So here we can see some of the donation drives that we've conducted. Um, we've done book drives, we've done food drives, supply drives, um, just a variety of things that help us connect with the local uh, community. And one of our ongoing projects is our work with Hobby Elementary School. So Hobby Elementary is a is an elementary school in Houston area with a population of over 90% economically disadvantaged students. And so we've donated to them um, monetarily and we've helped as tutors um, going very often to help tutor their students. And so we've built an ongoing relationship with them. And in addition, we also have a large variety of other events. So for example, whether it be our summer tutoring projects where we tutor both local students and- um, uh, And then uh, earlier this week I met with- one Sorry about that. Um, the past summer, 2020, we connected with some students in Wuhan, China, and we actually tutored them over Zoom. So we paired up um, one tutor to two students, and we would have Zoom sessions, which you can see in the top left. And in addition, we've done, for example, flag planting projects in Bel Air. Uh, we've worked with our school and just a, a wide variety of, of projects. In addition, one of my jobs as president and some of our officers' jobs is to work with the city. So the city is one of our biggest partners. Um, oftentimes they host really, really large events, right? So um, our normal events, we might have 15 to 20 people who can attend. The city often will host events where they need over 50 volunteers. Um, so they're a great opportunity for our entire group to go and also just to connect with different people. Um, these opportunities really have helped us gain recognition in not just the local community because the public also attends these large events. For example, the Celebration of Freedom, our July 4th celebration. We also have a local thing called Spring Fest, which has happened today, which used to be Winter Fest. So they have a big um, festival where they have snow events and all that kind of stuff. But they also help us with recognition in the local government because the Parks and Recreation Department is part of the local government. And working with that coordinator, he will also push us into the city council or with a mayor or such, right? So they're a really, really important partner for us. They have been, um, even when we just started out, when we just started out as a smaller branch, we would often still go to these events, but we would only fill up maybe, let's say a third of the spots, right? And they would find other organizations to um, fill up the rest of the spots. And now being as large as we are, we've become one of the primary partners for the city. And there are some events that they host that are exclusively available to us. Um, events that we'll often talk about, we'll often coordinate and organize, and will only be available to A-list members because of the relationship that we've built. Building on top of that recognition, um, we've received recognition not just from um, Parks and Recreation as a general thank you, but also within the government. So um, we received a certi certificate of recognition from the mayor of Pearland. Uh, we've received beautification awards from Keep Pearland Beautiful, and we've been featured in the Houston Chronicle, which um, I guess not all of you are from the Houston area, but Houston Chronicle is a fairly large news organization and community impact, um, and which those I'll talk about a little bit later. So starting small, right? Every branch, no branch starts out with over 150 members with 
a bunch of money, none of that stuff, right? So um, a lot of our notable accomplishments, I think, are so important because of where we started. Uh, initially, we started with garage sales and power washing. You see me in the top left um, doing some power washing for a um, for as, as a little project, and then also the garage sales, which are obviously the middle and top right pictures. And so the power washing thing started as one of our members um, had a power washing system, and we just through word of mouth and flyers post up around the neighborhood. Um, we basically fundraised a little bit of money for that. And then our garage sales were conducted with the help of the A-list community. So we had members and families donate clothes and other miscellaneous items. As volunteers, we organized them and then we sold them on one or two dates, um, just with little posters and flyers around the neighborhood, inviting people in to come check it out. And these events really brought in a, an appreciable amount of funds but um, a lot of these funds were either saved or more often they were donated back to the community. So um, a lot of our funds, for example, the garage sale funds in the first couple of years were exclusively donated to Texas Math and Science Coaches Association, TMSCA, um, is a middle school level competition, academic competition, or to high school level clubs such as Model UN, which is fairly big, and Youth in Government, which is run by the YMCA. So obviously with, um, so for, sorry, for a couple of years, these activities were our primary source of fundraising. Obviously with COVID-19, this changed because we were unable to have um, in-person events or large groups of in-person events in a lot of uh, in the beginning of COVID. And so we had to find ways to adapt. Um, we found numerous opportunities to support our own serve our community with COVID though, because along with adversity came opportunity, right? So. Um, with the greater Houston area so heavily impacted by the pandemic, the Pearland Chinese Association, Ellis Pearland, and the Hoshia Chinese School Pearland Campus all worked together to raise funds and collect donations for personal protective equipment um, for a variety of different areas for first responders and healthcare workers. So within a week, our community brought together, had raised over $12,000 in supplies and funds, um, which was donated noted to the city of Pearland, the medical staff at CHI St. Luke's Health Anesthesiology Department, um, Memorial Hermann Pearland Hospital, Baylor St. Luke's Emergency Center, and a variety of nursing homes. Um, you can see these, uh, we had a lot of materials, like enough for a small like U-Haul truck um, and a variety of pictures and you see us packing them. And these are actually some of the events that really got us to higher recognition within our local community and brought us some more partnerships. So this is where we were featured on, by Houston Chronicle and by a community impact. And then came February. So February in 2021, again, we faced a lot of difficulties. Um, if any of you are from the South, you probably remember the winter storm. If any of you are from Texas, you probably remember all the rolling blackouts. And um, a lot of that was, it was a very difficult time for a lot of people. But we also realized that there's another opportunity. So obviously, Plants don't really do well with the cold. And we realized that with the freeze, a lot of people's house plants had died. So we found this to be a great opportunity um, to again, try to fundraise a little bit, try to support our community. And so sponsored by Project, Project Rise and Shine, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and a bunch of local donations. Uh, we collected supplies and had members um, plant and nurse uh, vegetable and flower seeds and seedlings, which we were later sold. So you can see a lot of the members here um, just with the various plants they had. And then we sold the seedlings and that was a huge success. So we grew tomato, bell pepper, okra, cucumber, green bean, and then a bunch of flowers. So like sunflowers, moss rose, cosmos, marigolds, and more. Um, the first round of seedling sales was a massive success. Uh, we raised over $1,700 and that encouraged us to continue into July and beyond. Um, and I believe we still have a third round anticipated. And it was around this time that we began, uh, we became acquainted with Project Rise and Shine and the Hog Foundation, which is one of our current sponsors. So we participated and won their We Together 2020 competition um, by featuring our local efforts and supporting local workers during the onset of the pandemic. Um, in addition, we won a flexible grant by the Hog Foundation for promoting youth mental health um, through or, uh, organizing volunteer events for both 2020 and 2021. So Project Right and Shine, whose mission is to focus on the developmental needs of Asian American adolescents and develop prevention plans and policies has been a crucial partner. 
um, not only because they've helped us make phone, can someone mute their phone? Um, but also because that their mission and their beliefs fall in line with ours, right? Ours is to, ours is that in part that service to the community brings greater personal fulfillment. And so being in line, we found that working together was really easy and, and was really be mutually beneficial to both of us. And in recent months, we've st still found new opportunities. For example, um, just this past uh, fall, there is a local farmer's market that popped up and having name recognition in our community, we volunteered for them a few times, just helping them set up, um, helping them do crowd control. And we also had the opportunity to sell a couple of um, local items at one of the, as one of their vendors or as a, as a booth. And so through these efforts and through a lot of these um, trials, I guess, we've learned a lot of valuable lessons, right? The first, and I think one of the most important is to bond with and collaborate with a bunch of the local organizations, especially, um, I believe there was an earlier member who just started their own A-list branch. If you can connect with the city's park and, parks and recreation or special events team, that's such a, a beneficial relationship to build. Um, and not just that, you know, your members, our members aren't just A-list members. They're also members in high school, they're members in their clubs, right? National Honor Society, Asian Culture Club, all of these things give us opportunities to connect and to be able to serve our community, not just by ourselves, but with other organizations as well. Secondly, um, seeking opportunities, like I just said, um, in current events, especially current events, a lot of the events that are ongoing um, really help mobilize the community. They're the ones that are really upfront and, and in your face. And so because of that, the community tends to respond the best, right? COVID. Um, the winter freeze. They were both great times of struggle, but also great opportunities that allowed us to come together and to unite. And taking advantage that, of that fact really facilitated fundraising and just general volunteer work. Um, and finally, persistence and patience. Our branch started pretty small and the growth that you see here, the events that we've done um, and the recognition we've received is across five years. It doesn't happen in a couple of months. It doesn't happen in a year or two. It really takes a long time and a lot of building up, right? And so um, a big part of that was reinvesting the funds that we uh, received in our early years, reinvesting into the local clubs and stuff, building those relationships really laid a solid foundation for us in terms of growing our organization um, people-wise and just in general. And so with that, um, thank you again to Cassie. Uh, thank you again to the A-List National Group for inviting me to speak. And thank you all for joining us this evening and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, next, we will have Andrew Yao and Kevin Chen from the Greater Princeton branch, where they will share their experience on organizing charity performances, fundraising, and more. Also, I just want to say to Andy, that was really beautifully said and organized. And yeah. So hello everyone and welcome to our first Alliance Development Summit. So for this presentation, Kevin and I will be your speakers. We are from the Greater Princeton branch of Elias. So next slide. Okay. So some quick introductions. I'm Andrew Yao, a sophomore. Um, Kevin, can you okay? So I'm a sophomore from New Jersey. I go to school at Wachung Hills Regional High School, and I am a development minister. So I joined the Elias Greater Princeton branch in September 2021, and I'm responsible for developing all kinds of volunteer activities and events for the GPA, such as the public speaking seminar. Hello, uh, my name is Kevin Chen, and I'm a 16-year-old sophomore attending um, Wachung Hills Regional High School as well. And I joined the Alliance for Youth Leaders of America, um, Greater Princeton branch at around November 2021. And I'm currently acting as its chief philanthropy officer, which is responsible for organizing and overseeing charity and fundraising light. events. Did you turn it off? from the Greater Princeton branch, such as the Her Youth Benefit all, we're gonna watch Concert. This. Wait, let me unmute someone. Okay. 
so some service done. So um, together, Kevin and I have undertaken numerous activities within Elias to benefit the community as a whole. And these activities include senior care center donations, senior care center concerts, gardening work at the Reeves Reed Arboretum, seminars with figures such as Dr. Belfield and Lauren Zhu, recruiting new members, and contributions to the Save a Life Meal Donation Program through funds that we gathered through the third annual Youth Benefit Concert. Uh, speaking of the Youth Benefit Concert, we consider it as one of our most significant achievements of our new and burgeoning uh, volunteer experience. And the third uh, A-List Youth Benefit Concert, which despite its name was actually not one, but two concerts that were held on uh, January 15th, 2022 in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. And they're um, from 1 to 3.30 p.m. and 4 to 6.30 p.m. respectively. And in total, after around six hours of music from a whole host of different instruments, uh, we raised approximately $5,600 from donations and sponsorships. And all the funds were used to buy uh, free dinners, um, free of charge to be distributed to first responders across the country. So, in order for any social event, let alone a charity concert, to run smoothly, uh, you have to have very, you know, detailed and robust planning. And this includes, but is not limited to, uh, finding the right venue to host a concert, audio and sound testing within the venue, um, adjusting um, the concert to meet COVID restrictions and recommendations, designing uh flyers to like you know spread and advertise the event finding performers to actually perform at the event creating a program list to order the performers and finding sponsors to sponsor and donate to the concert and it's safe to say that this isn't a easy task and it required the combined effort of both me andrew and our parents um so one of the first things you need to do in order to plan a youth benefit concert is to find the venue to actually hold the concert in. And this is surprisingly difficult. Um, this okay. This is especially difficult because the cost of the venue, the size of the venue, the availability of the venue and the number of COVID restrictions all factor into the decision-making process. And in the end, uh, we basically chose the, um, the large chapel of Fellowship Deaconry, which is um, 3735 Valley Road in Basking Ridge, New Jersey, 07920, because it was both large, open, and relatively cheap. And we also had, like me personally, I had prior experience in past recitals performing here. So it was like also somewhat familiar to me. So I can sort of like point people to like where the bathrooms are, for example. Um, and then for one of the most important uh, behind the scenes challenges that we had to navigate through were the COVID restrictions that were made uh necessary as a result of the Omicron variant of the COVID-19 pandemic. So as you all remember, the Youth Benefit Concert was held in a time where the super contagious Omicron vi variant was hitting its peak with the U.S. recording well over 750,000 cases a year. And you can see in like this chart, like the peak of the Omicron was right at the middle of January. So Obviously, a concert held in a time like this has to have the yes. necessary precautions in place to prevent its attendance from getting COVID, or at least reducing yes. the chance that yes. it will happen. So as such, uh, five main COVID precautions were put into place before and during the concert. So before the concert, all performers and spectators were required to be vaccinated or show proof that they tested negative um, of the COVID-19 within a week. Um, which is to ensure that no one coming to the concert had COVID. And then during the concert, masks were required at all times. Uh, can someone mute their mic? Wait, can one use iPhone mute your mic? Okay, wait, let me do that. Okay, um, during the concert, masks were required at all times, except for when a performer was on the stage where they had the option to remove it like for the duration of their performance. 
And in between performances, all mics and the piano were san sanitized with wet wipes. And then lastly, the amount of people in the concert was capped and all attendants sat socially distanced from each other. Basically, like the spectators would be like one seat and then like one seat empty and then another seat like that. And even though these precautions don't guarantee that COVID won't spread put together, um, we were able to effectively mitigate the COVID spread within the Youth Benefit concert. And then for a concert to be successful, you obviously need performers to, you know, perform in the concert. Um, and there are almost like um, 70 performers and they learned of the concert through a variety of ways. Um, a significant portion of them were from my mom's piano students and her friend's students. However, while not every one of you um, is the son of a piano teacher, if you were to run a benefit concert in the future, recruiting friends who are musically gifted is also extremely vital and important, regardless of the instrument. So it doesn't really matter um, if they don't play the piano or the violin, like they can play a very, you know, obscure instrument. Like for example, one of my friends who I recruited to get into the concert played the mridanga, which is like a very not well-known instrument from Sri Lanka. And he still like went in and he still did very well in his performance despite playing an obscure instrument. And it doesn't even matter if they're extremely proficient as well in their instrument, as long as they can play it. So that is very important as well. And then expanding upon my point before, the almost 70 uh, performers who took the stage in the concert were of all different ages and they played all different instruments, including the piano, violin, cello, voice, and redungum. And also the genre of the music during the performance was also very diverse with uh, genres such as classical, pop, country, and songs from movies. And they all made appearances during the concert. So stressing our point about diversity, um, we basically took advantage of the variety in instruments, genres, and ages to craft a program list that was engaging and equally highlighted everyone's strengths and talent talents. So we diverged from a lot of like, like normal um, status quo concerts. So what they would do was most of those concerts were mostly just one or two instruments like piano or violin. So the selection wasn't very diverse. And also they would order their um, performances from like youngest to oldest or like least skilled to most skilled. And if you did that, right, that, I wouldn't really blame you if you would get bored during the concert. So we actually took an innovative approach and we mixed up the order so that beginners um, and pros, young and old, instrument and voice, they'll be playing like one after another. Like instead of like having five pianos in a row, you'd have two piano performances. Then you would punctuate that with like one violin performance or one voice performance and then have two piano performances after that. So that way it keeps the concert engaging for um, the spectators. And once the order was established for both concerts, a program list was made um, and that documented like the order of the performances and that was printed and distributed to all performers and attendees. Okay. So for sponsors and donations, in order to find suitable sponsors and donors for the Third Youth Benefit concert, we had to call upon our many advisors and organizers to reach out to small and medium-sized businesses that they had good relations with. And we heavily recommend that when looking for sponsors or donors, you reach out to people or businesses that you have a good relationship with as it is much easier to convince them to donate to your cause than some random small business you just found out about. So in addition, you must clearly emphasize that all of these donations will be going to a certain cause, which would directly benefit the community. For example, for this third youth benefit concert, we convinced our sponsors to donate as much as possible to help give meals to first aid squads and rescue squads, which are mostly volunteer in our area. So we were able to secure around like 14 donors, which raised a lot of money and contributed enormously to our Save a Life project. And most notably were our gold sponsors, which included Garden, Garden Home Realty, Edison Dental Care, and America Advanced Financial, which all contributed significantly. So for hosting the concert, we had eight hosts over two concerts. The first concert hosts included me, Kevin, Judy Zong, and Annie Dong. 
And the second concert included Jasmine Wilk, Xing Liao, Kevin, and I. And the hosts were crucial in giving the opening and closing statements, introducing each performer, and wiping down the piano or microphone after each performance. So before the, co the concert began, us hosts had a Zoom meeting in order to determine what, what parts we would each play during the concert. For example, one host must be given the job of organizing performers backstage to make sure that they're all in order. One host must be in charge of delivering the closing statement. And one host must help in handing out awards at the end of the concert. So in order to recruit new allies members, we reached out to our friends, family, and the people of our school. So contacting them is easy, but convincing them to become a part of allies is much harder. But if you answer these four questions, you, become, you can become much more persuasive. First, you have to ask yourself, why would they want to join Elias? What can they get out of it? Do they want to help the elderly? Do they want to promote their community? Do they want to spread awareness for minorities? You need to find out their general interest in community service and use those points to persuade them. Second, you need to find out what they're interested in. Do they like art? Do they enjoy gardening? Are they interested in math and coding? you need to find activities that they would want to do. For example, gardening and working at the arbitorium if they enjoy nature and outdoors. Third, where do they live? How far are volunteer activities from them? Usually it is best for volunteer activities to be no more than 30 minutes drive away. Any more than that would be usually considered to be too tedious for a member. Fourth, when can they volunteer? What if they have other activities and other schedules? It is important to know someone's schedule and, re and responsibilities and whether or not they actually have the time to join Elias. If someone continuously refuses, don't continue pushing them, as this could damage your, your, the relationship between you and the person you are recruiting. Appeal what they want to see in their community changed, what they like to do, and give them some time to think about it. As many of you already know, the Save a Life meal program, which is dedicated to giving meals to organizations that are working on the front lines of the pandemic um, to save as many lives as possible. So that's the organization. And therefore, in order to create um, a Save a Life meal donation, you need to first contact uh, local hospitals, rescue squads, first aid squads, etc. So um, the best case would be you should try to call them first. And if you're contacting them, especially like a hospital, uh, they're very, you know, busy. So you have to be prepared to be redirected many times and put on hold as, um, as again, I reiterate, like they're pretty busy. So when you do this, don't get anxious or nervous if they don't pick up right away. Um, this is what I did initially. Like when I first tried to call the hospital, I was like very nervous. But um, actually in reality, once you like get redirected to the right person, um, the hospital staff is actually very nice and they won't scream at you if you're trying to contact them. And if they like, for some reason, they don't answer your calls at the end, you can always try to email them in order to get their attention. And once you established a line of connection with um, first responders, you basically have to arrange a specific team that you can meet up with them to drop the food. Um, you also have to find a suitable date where they can be um, ready. So you have to establish that you're ready at all times and you have to wait for them for their suitable date and not the other way around. So preferably you should find a date that would, where there's like a lot of people at once. So something like a team meeting, for example. And then after that, you have to pick up supplies and deliver them um, to them. And there's also a question about whether you should deliver, you know, delivered food like pizza or like pre-made food like from a supermarket. And that's also something you can establish during your communication with them. And as for the communication after the initial phone call, it's best to do it through text messages because it's um, faster. However, you can also do it with um, email if you don't get a number. And these are just some examples of text messages that I had. Um, so like this one on the all the way left, right? This is between um, Kelly and she was one of the hospital staff. And basically once I called her, um, which a side point, I was redirected like three times during the hospital, but at the end I was able to reach her and she was very nice to me. And in this like text interaction, I asked, you know, like we said this time would be good. 
And she established that you can drop off at the main entrance to the hospital. I'm coordinating with a team at the hospital to make sure they arrive. And then I had a question about, you know, like where the parking spot is. And then she answered, um, you can pull up at the top of the hill. So like that's something that you have to do after the phone call. And this is another text um, conversation that I had with a fire captain from Warren. And I basically did the same thing. Um, I was asking like, we basically set up a date before and then i was asking like how many people will be how, how many people will be there and what time should we like arrive and sh he answered oh we're going to be about 20 people and we'll all get there at 7 p.m and yeah and here are some emails like example of some emails just in case like you don't get a phone number and i was asking you know a question about whether we should send food and they answered and they established a date where we can come and I basically responded and asked some questions and about how many people and everything. And they responded like that. So I guess main point is don't be too scared. So how do you initiate small activities? So the Alliance of Youth Leaders encourages its members to create their own volunteer opportunities and activities. And there are two ways to go about this. Either find volunteer activities outside of Alliance that you could, Elias that you can join and then get some approval to, to make it into an approved Elias activity or create your own activity from scratch, such as a save a life meal donation. Either way, research is crucial. You can find multiple sites on Google that can help locate volunteer opportunities near you. For example, Kevin and I did a little research and found, and found some volunteer work at the Reeves Reed Arbitorium. We contacted them through a call and asked if we could join in on one of their weekly sessions, and they were very glad to get some extra hands. Also, if you can think of any activities to create, just do some quick searches on the Elias website where you can discover what other Elias members did and are doing to inspire yourself. So it is also recommended for small activities to be more consistent so that members can do these volunteer work frequently. Um, next slide. Okay. If you want to initiate a larger scale activity, for example, a seminar or a concert, you will need to do lots of thinking and lots of planning. We recommend at least five days to a week of planning and brainstorming. After that, you will need to obtain some approval from a senior executive member, such as a branch president, in order to initiate the event. In addition, large-scale events would definitely need more than one person to take charge, so it is ideal to recruit other members and friends to help you in this undertaking. Next is making a poster. Um, try to make it as flashy and attractive as possible in order to get as many spectators as possible. And when hosting the event, make sure everything runs smoothly. And just to warn you, um, there have there always will be mishaps during such large activities. And no plan survives first contact with the real world. So you should always have some backup plan just in case to deal with the unexpected. So one large scale event that I hosted was an online seminar with Dr. Belfield. And he was, um, as a for a quick background, a, de a dean of NJIT, which is a university, a professor of chemistry and environmental science. He was also a chair and professor of the, at, the at the Department of Chemistry um, at Central Florida. And he became a fellow of, of the American Chemical Society in 2019. And he did some postdoctoral research at Sunny University and Harvard. So how did I meet him? So coincidentally, Dr. Belfield and I are neighbors and his family invited ours for a Thanksgiving party where I asked him if he wanted to do a seminar. And he said, yes. So I got it approved and it took me a few days to piece together a poster. So what this shows is that, um, can you go back to the, you, okay. Let's go back to the other slide. You went forward a bit. Yeah, okay, thanks. So this shows that you can like explore the options around you, get to know the people around your neighborhood, in your community, and maybe unexpectedly one of them can be a very important and an esteemed individual, which you can have a seminar with. So after I got it approved, it took me a few days to piece together a poster. I took about a week of planning to set up a Zoom meeting, discuss a suitable time to do, to do the seminar, and get the poster out online to circulate. And the seminar was mainly about his journey from a college student to an NJIT dean, some programs that the NJIT offered, and what life for an NJIT college student was like. So for this seminar, around 20 people came, 
And after that, it was just about editing the video, which took around two hours. So for video editing software, I recommend WeVideo. And if you have a MacBook, you should probably use iMovie. Um, next slide. Thank you. Okay. So another example is a debate, public speaking, and leadership seminar that I hosted with speaker Lauren Su in early January. So for a quick background, Lauren Su was a president of a high, of his own high school debate team in 2020. He was the captain of the PF division, and right now he's currently a UPenn Penn Debate Society member. He's also studying at UPenn University. So he went to a lot of large national tournaments and won many awards at them. And also, most notably, he was um, the co-president of the organization Branch Out, which was a, an organization very alike to Elias. And they focused on tutoring and teaching, and they were based in the Washington, D.C. area. So I met Lawrence through an online public forum debate class they hosted in the summer of 2020. He was an extremely good teacher, and he helped me cultivate my love for public speaking and debate. Over winter break, I asked him if he wanted to be a guest speaker for an online seminar, and he agreed. I got it approved. I made the poster. And this time, we had 70 participants. So this time, I was extremely nervous because of the mass influx of people. And I found myself talking a lot faster than usual. So if you find yourself being very nervous and talking very fast, just take a quick breather. Try to slow down. It is very important for people to actually hear what you're saying. And we pulled through without any large mishaps. And editing the video, once again, took around two to three hours. And just for a quick note, both videos of the seminars are on Delia's website. You can quickly find them through a search for um, Belfield, which is B-E-L-F-I-E-L-D, and searching the term public speaking. And you should be able to find them. Oh, no. Um, next slide. And thank you everyone for listening, and on to the next speaker. Next, we have Sarah Yen, Judy Zhang, and Olivia Mo, who will share more about how the Greater Princeton Branch conducts our fundraising and donations. Sarah, you may begin first. Um, is it possible for you to share your screen? I think Kevin will pull it up. Is it still one? Okay. All right, so good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah, and I'm vice president from the Greater Princeton A-List branch. So today I'll be briefly talking about the Meals from the Heart, the Greater Princeton A-List food donations. Uh, next slide. All right, so our mission with Meals from the Heart is to give back to the community and show our appreciation to all the frontline workers. We like to help the people who help our community, especially during the tough times of the pandemic, by donating meal packages. All these frontline workers work really hard every single day to take care of our community. And by donating meals is showing our appreciation for everyone uh, and what they do and our way of saying thanks. Our next slide. So how do we organize these meals? Uh, so these are the general steps taken to prepare the food donation events. So by uh, organizing donations uh, has many steps. And the first one is planning. So the organizers need to decide on a location and who we want to donate to. We need to make sure that it is someplace new and that we haven't donated to in the past. So once it is decided where we're gonna to donate to, the next part is calling the donation place. So through a call, we confirm that they are okay with us and the members of A-List coming and donating the food. And then we discuss how many people are there at the location. So this way we know how much food we need to prepare to donate. Organizers also need to discuss what date works best to drop off the food. And we also talk briefly uh, with the frontline workers so we can also get a picture for A-List. 
We need to be mindful about availability and what time works best for everyone since we all have different schedules. And it is best to plan these events on weekends and not during school day since most of us uh, A-list volunteers have school during the week. Picking a date also involves deciding a time to drop it off and generally speaking, either in the morning or midday where, uh, when it's still light outside. Lastly, it is um, important to ask if there are any allergies among the staff of the workers or any preferences they have. So after talking to the donation place, uh, we need a call to order the food ahead of time. And this is better to call an order ahead of time to pick up so it's guaranteed that they will have exactly what we want to donate. And lastly, once everything is planned out and confirmed, we spread the word through the A-List WeChat group so other A-List members can also come and help donate the food to the uh, hard frontline workers. One important thing to learn from this experience is to always double check with the location and food supply place. So one example of this was actually a personal example that happened uh, on a donation that I organized on September 11th. So I called the fire company and we organized the donation for early morning. And the, I called in the day before to confirm the time. And when I was confirming the time, the chief told me that they had to go to a 9-11 memorial ceremony and that they wouldn't be there at that time. So we had to reschedule for a later time. So if I didn't call to confirm the donation time, then it would have ended with us A-list members going to donate the food and no firefighters there, which would not have been good. So basically, the lesson learned here is that it's always important to confirm and double check your time when organizing an event. Next slide. So here are some examples of where we have donated to. So as you can see from these pictures, we have donated to fire stations uh, and first aid and rescue squads, fire and emergency services, hospitals, and urgent, care, uh, and urgent care meal donations. So thank you everyone for your time. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Next we have Judy Zhang. Wait, can you share? Um, I believe I can, let me see. Uh, am I sharing my screen? You were for like a second. Oh, okay. Uh, let's try that again. Yep, you are now. All right, this works. Um, what's... Okay, so I'll just start now. Um, hi everyone, my name is Judy and this is my uh, presentation for today. So about me, I go to Joy Englewood and I'm currently a 10th grader. I live in Bergen County. I joined ALIS around uh, New Year's and um, I am now a development minister. And also I love, love, love food and music. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly go over some benefit concert hosting and coordinating experiences, meals to first responders, um, recruiting new members and promoting ILIS, and a summary of what I've learned. So here's the ILIS mission statement. After I read, um, after I joined ILIS, I read, I read this. So then that brings me to the next slide, which is the four C's. So basically, these are a few examples of or important things that I've learned after joining. So compassion, and that's like, that's what made me want to give back to the community with skills through like concerts. And then communication, which is being more open to others is key, especially for someone who was extremely shy when I was younger, like me. And um, connections, so connections with performers like my dance, uh, my dance class friends, and then just outreach helped me host multiple, multiple concerts. And finally coordinating. So these are experiences that help with my leadership skills and I found very useful. Okay, so here are some benefit concerts I hosted. Uh, the Christmas concerts actually I hosted before I joined, joined A-List, which is kind of in, um, so then, which is kind of interesting because I held the President's, the President's Day's performance after I joined A-List. So it was cool to see the um, differences between those two and how far I guess I've gone. 
So here's the programs. And um, something I learned is that, of course, as, uh, the, as, the, as some people said before, it, nothing goes your way when it comes to these events. So actually for one of the Christmas concerts, um, the, Christmas, the senior center kept sending me uh, new events that they wanted to put in. So then the program kept changing until the last day. So then it was very frustrating and we had to reprint the, all the programs again. But uh, the President's Day one went way smoother and I was able to see the seniors again, which is kind of nice. And here's just some pictures from Christmas performances. My friends, uh, there's more pictures. And then the next one was the Eyeless Youth Benefit concert. So I was a performer and an MC, and I helped host, I guess I was part of hosting the hosting community for committee for this. And this is my first time hosting a concert of this size, which is a new experience for me. And also it was my first time singing at a concert. So here's uh, the next is Save a Life Meals. Um, these are some of the places I've contacted. And uh, some, well, First, I had to basically Google them, and then I just called. Um, I called about like twenty, and these are the only ones that responded. But uh, some people didn't respond, so I was just sitting there and panicking because I'm like, "Why are they not answering me?" But eventually, I got into contact with some of these. So the first one was Holy Name. Uh, Holy Name is relatively close to my home, so we just went. We just went to the ER, and then we waited. Uh, I eventually got in contact with Christine, um, Christine Raycraft. So she came out and then talked to me and then we scheduled a time and then we went there. So here's us outside the ER and we're bringing in the food. Um, the next is Hackensack Meridian. So I got in contact, I just called them and then got directed like three, four times. Eventually uh, Greg picked up, he's a registered nurse at the Meridian Medical Center. And then we talked to each other and then we brought some we brought some food to them and then we're still in contact now. So for them, I guess we ordered from Chinook Sushi House, the creative food right there. And then we got some fruits from the supermarket, more food. And then these these two, um, the two texts on the side are for Teaneck um, Volunteer Ambulance Corp. Uh, this one actually, it didn't go very, it didn't go very well in the beginning. We uh, the person I contacted happened to be on call when we got there. So then, uh, but we just knocked on their door and they were very nice and we were, they were very happy after we brought in the food. Here's us and they even showed us around. So here's us in an ambulance. And the last one is the Teaneck Fire Department headquarters. And we went there after one of my first swim practices actually. Um, and this is where we met, uh, this is where we met Chelsea and Miss Joyce, which is some of the new members. And then here's our new members and contacts that we are uh, trying to recruit or have already recruited. And so, as a conclusion, these are the four these are the four skills I learned that um, are very important to me. And special thanks to everyone here. And thank you. Thank you, Judy. And next we have Olivia. Olivia Mo. Should I just share my screen? Yeah, if that's best of you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about the food donation. So I'm Olivia Mel, and I joined the AILAs around 2019 during October. So it's been like two years from now. And so for food donations, our main event is to donate food to nearby hospitals and medical centers. And we um, get our fundraise through performances to find more money through performances that we were able to donate and then we can help more hospitals. Um, so the basic process for donation to hospitals. So first we need to search for hospitals and medical centers and we need to contact them by, um, through email, text, or phone call and see if they're willing to let us donate to them. Um, their email can usually be found on their local website and there should be like a phone call. And if it's better, you can get their personal phone call that will be more convenient. Um, and then it, you should schedule a time to um, to donate to them and specifically pay attention to the location because that can sometimes be confusing. And after you've 
um, decided upon a time and a location for the donation, you should start a sign up in the WeChat group so that other people who want to join your donation can sign up and then you want to get food. Um, so some obstacles I faced during my process of donating. Um, first of all, it's slow responses. So I started with reaching out um, with email. So my first or um, the first time of me organizing the donation is to the Princeton First Aid and Rescue Squad. And I initially reached out using email and they were really slow in responding. Um, and the other time when I was contacting a person from Capital Health Center, they were also really slow um, with text messages. So it is better if you can just phone call them. It is more convenient and you can get like a direct schedule and a direct response instead of just waiting. And some other obstacles is getting food because if we want to get hot meals, we usually get, um, we should get them at nearby stores or else they will be very cold by the time of the donation. So something to keep in mind, um, be sure to, con um, during contact, it usually works better to phone call them as I just previously mentioned, because you will get a quicker response. And be sure to ask for food preferences like non-perishable food, or hot meals and ask their preferences, see if there are any allergies or maybe there are people who are vegetarians that you want to get some um, vegetable food. And for scheduling, double check the time and location just in case something went wrong. And also make sure to ask for the amount of people that are present on the day of the do um, donation to get the appropriate amount of food. So this avoid from from you like getting too little of a food for them and before um be sure to ask for contact information so that you can reach out to them if you have any other questions after the schedule so um during the time when i was organizing the donation to capital health we actually need to change the time from saturday to sunday so um if you have a contact information of them you can just reach out to them if not, you'll have to go through another like emails and stuff. Um, when getting food, um, if you're getting hot meals, be sure to find nearby stores so that your food is not completely cold. And also it could be hard because some stores don't usually open in the morning or they cannot prepare your food on time. So just make sure you double check on that. And on donation day, if you're the organizer, make sure to arrive 15 minutes earlier um, and notify participant the exact location for parking and assembly. So it is better if you take a picture or send your location when you're there so that um, your participant can just find it easily. So this is our donation to the Princeton First Aid and Rescue Squad. Um, this is the one when we're at the Princeton Medical Center and the Capitol Health Medical Center, and we get to tour around at the Princeton, um, Princeton Medical Center. And this is um, the donation that happened recently um, at Capital Health Trauma Center in Trenton. And we actually um, helped them to get the food also inside of their hospital. So that's pretty cool. And yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Olivia. Now we'll open up our Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type it out in the chat or open your mic and ask. So does anyone have any questions? Okay. Um, so for the recording thing, we will be later posting this on the ALIS website. So we'll let you know when the video, video is ready. Um, for how to fundraise for these donations, um, Kevin or Andrew, do you wanna like do a quick summary of what you mentioned before. Okay, so for fundraising, um, these donations is primar primarily through uh, donations and sponsorships. So everyone who's performing in the concert has to pay a $50 fee. 
and that will be i guess put into a pool of money and additionally like the sponsors they will also um give you money as well so yeah and then i guess i can also speak a little bit about fundraising um fundraising doesn't just have to come from the event itself obviously if you're hosting, hosting a concert or something you can um have a like a entrance fee kind of thing but for general like donations if you just want to have a backup fund um starting small with like like we do garage sales and power washing right and so a lot of the times we collect at least a portion of those funds and just save them up and so when you have that built up you can um also use those for donation helping with donations in, in future events as well Um, for our next question for how to communicate with A-list members in general for announcements and stuff, we will um, use it in, in WeChat so both the parent and the student can um, see that and like schedule around those um, dates. Um, other than that, we also have a Discord that we can just use for other things like that. Besides that, do we have any other questions? Um, can you put the Discord invite link in chat? Sure. Um, All right, thanks. I would I could send it later. Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. Um for the person named AX, for the WeChat group, it okay, right, so for getting into contact with your branch leaders, etc. It would depend on where you're living right now. So if you're already in a branch, they should have their own like communication system. For us, wait, AX, <laughs> do, do you want to open your mic and like just share where your situation is? Because I'm not sure like how much to help you. For branches, there are like a, around over a hundred across the country. So if you live near one, you could contact them and see if you can join their group, their branch. And um, there is usually emails on each of the branch pages. So by emailing them and saying that you want to join, um, that should like work out and you can join their WeChat group or whatever communication system they use. Okay, got it. I can put the um, the website for the, all the A-list branches in the chat, so you can access that after the meeting. Um, in the meantime, do we have any other questions? If not, um, okay. I'll just say my concluding remarks. Then, okay, Brian Liu. So, do you have a plan to apply certain public fund? Wait, I'm not really sure what you mean by public fund. Do you want to elaborate on that um, with your mic off? from government or from other company. Generally, the government doesn't allocate funds for these organizations, especially since the, this is a nonprofit organization. And um, for companies, I <laughs> The only thing that I could think of that's related to this would be like sponsorships and stuff that we could ask like, um, company members to uh, like, like if we have a certain event, we want them to sponsor, we can ask them to allocate funds for it. 
then I'm going to add on a little bit to that on the government side. So uh, we work we work really closely with the city um, and their Parks and Recreation Department. And so even though they don't have a like specific fund um, per se, right? If we have an event idea or we have something that we want to do because of our relationship, we can talk with them and then we can try to build something up. They typically do have at least some resources and some flexibility in that sense. And so if you're looking for um, funds in that sense, you can ask them and work with them on that, but there's typically not like a specific monetary fund that you can access as, as a nonprofit branch. Oh, okay. So for starting a new branch, you will have to, you can go onto the ALS website and then you can email um, alist.org at gmail.com. That is basically the national email. And there is also an application form that's attached to the website where you can fill that out and um, like state where you are and what, what you want your branch to be named of. And like for the first just few steps, you would definitely need to find a few leadership members to join you. Um, Okay, sorry about that. Um, so basically you want a few members who are generally in like the high school age range and um, you want to discuss with them and um, decide who wants to take which role like president or secretary, et cetera. Um, by just like filling out that form and emailing the national branch, um, there will be like approval process and we will set up your website for you and um, all, everything will follow after that. Okay, does anyone else have any questions or want to add on to what I've already said? Okay. Um, if not, well, thank you everyone for coming to the first development summit for the ELA Scholar Network. I hope that all of you will find different ways to carry out volunteering and fundraising um, activities um, and participate in the ELA Scholar Network. So thank you again for joining and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Have a nice day.